All right. Good morning and welcome. I'm Mark Stadola. I am so glad to be here. So I'm in from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm the probation fellow for American Probation and Parole Association. And my job is to provide training, technical assistance to courts, probation departments, treatment providers, people like you, on issues of high risk impaired driving. And that sweet spot is typically those people with multiple DUIs that don't learn the first time, they don't learn the second time. Uh, you get the picture because you work with those people. So uh, you are near and dear to my heart. So I have a question. How many of you, just raise your hands, how many of you were at the uh, November 2016 CADAP meeting? Just a couple hands. Well. It's like one of those, where were you? This was election day. It was the morning after election day that I had the opportunity to present. And I'm not gonna talk about all of the election results, but I am gonna talk about the fact that that was the day that recreational marijuana was legalized. And I will tell you from the standpoint of standing up on a stage and looking at the audience, you guys look so miserable. <laughs> you just had that deer in the headlights look about you like, what is going to happen now with recreational marijuana? And being from Arizona, I was thinking, well, thank goodness it didn't happen to me in Arizona. Ha, ha, ha. Four years later, uh, we ended up being in the same boat. So here is the plan. This is what we're going to cover over the next hour plus, is I want to talk to you um, about the emerging issue of drug-impaired driving. And when I say emerging, what I really mean is this is something that we really had not, and when I say we, we're talking about National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, um, those individuals that really have studied DUIs, this is something that was really overlooked. We hadn't been testing for drug-impaired driving. We hadn't really been putting our energy and our focus into it. And folks, the things that we're finding out about this population uh, is shocking. So the plan is, I'm gonna first of all, give you a little bit of a background. I wanna talk about the state of the state when it comes to uh, alcohol impaired driving, where we've made progress and where we really have gone in the wrong direction. Uh, then I wanna to talk to you about marijuana and impaired driving, what we're finding. There's some really good, robust information we're getting from Colorado, which is really kind of ground zero when it comes to uh, impaired driving. They were the first state to legalize recreational marijuana. Uh, then we're gonna really talk about, all right, what do we do as providers? How can we best address uh, the challenges with this population as it relates to treatment, as it relates to testing, supervision, uh, how law enforcement is dealing with this. So we're gonna cover all this all within one hour or so. So I want to start with just a couple photographs to kind of frame this issue for you. So this first photograph that you are looking at was taken actually, I believe in the Sacramento area. I know it was in Northern California. Uh, and this was a vehicle that ended up on the second floor. You heard that right. The second floor of a dentist office. And the reason that I bring this picture up is because of the fact that it was one of the first occasions where we found that the newscasters were identifying this as drug impaired driving. Because typically when we talk impaired driving, it's kind of everything is put in this big umbrella and the assumption is, well, they were drinking and that's why they got the DUI. So we found out uh, that really they're starting to look at this more as a separate, somewhat more unique issue. Backstory is this driver was using Coke and he hit a curb and he ended up in the second floor of the dentist office. Thank goodness the office was closed so nobody was hurt, uh, but that was kind of the, the backstory with this. Now, 
I am originally from a small town in Wisconsin, and a friend of mine from the small town sent me this picture that you're looking at of a, another flying vehicle. There seems to be a theme with drug-impaired driving and flying vehicles. And the backstory behind this was, again, a driver, this time smoking a whole lot of marijuana and drinking, uh, hit a curb and pancaked into the side of this house. And the article was priceless. The owner of the house said, yeah, I heard a noise in my bedroom and thought I should check it out. And that's what he walked into. Again, the driver was not hurt and did acknowledge that he's, and I quote, smoked a little bit too much marijuana. So, and then the final photograph that I want to show you before I move on, many of you have probably seen, but when we're talking about drug-impaired driving, I think this photograph is the most iconic photograph, at least that I've seen, that captures everything about uh, impaired driving. So the backstory of this is the couple in the front were heroin addicts. They went to their dealer to get a fix, and they decided that they couldn't wait to get home to use. They were driving back home. They both passed out uh, behind the wheel, and the photograph you're seeing was taken by the sheriff's officer in Ohio who came upon the scene. But the real focus of this picture is what you see in the back seat. Four-year-old boy who was the child of this couple that who knows what kind of lifelong impact this little boy is going to have. But this picture tells me not only the impact of this kind of driving with this couple and this little boy, but how does this impact our community? How does this impact the people that we care about? The innocent people that are on our roadways that may run into somebody, literally and figuratively, uh, who is impaired. So this is really, to me, the face of what we're looking at when it comes to drug-impaired driving. So let's start by talking about what we're seeing with DUIs driving under the influence of alcohol and where we've made some progress and where we have some real concerns, especially since COVID, uh, some really dramatic changes that we have been finding. So let me throw some statistics at you. Uh, 2019, which was pre-COVID, there were about a million individuals in this country arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. And historically, that number has been pretty static. Uh, it may go up 50,000, 75,000, or down by that amount, but it doesn't really change all that much from year to year. And it's important to mention, when these numbers go down, it has nothing to do with the number of impaired drivers on our roadways. It has everything to do with law enforcement priorities, law enforcement budgets, uh, what city councils are looking at, or even the states are looking at in terms of their budget priorities. So as much as I would love to say when you see these DUI numbers go down that we should all go out and celebrate, um, safely of course, it really has nothing to do with the number of drivers on our roadways that are under the influence. And there's research to suggest that as many as one in five drivers in this country could be under the influence of something that is potentially impairing. It could be a prescription medication. Uh, obviously, it could be something illegal. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how pervasive some of these numbers are. So... In 2020, we had 11,654 individuals, men, women, and children that were killed in drunk driving crashes. And please remember, folks, these are not accidents. Don't call these accidents. When somebody gets loaded, they get behind the wheel of a car. Everything that happens to them after that point is premeditated. 
So I learned the hard way doing a presentation for some prosecutors where I used the A word and I thought they were going to start throwing rocks at me. So these are crashes. So a um, couple other things just to, to be aware of when we're looking at these numbers. So I mentioned in 2019 about a million DUI arrests. If you look at the bottom bullet, 121 million drunk driving episodes that occurred in 2019. That's not 121 million drivers, that's episodes. So conceivably, I could have had somebody on my probation caseload that was driving five or six times during the course of a day under the influence. But the important thing to remember is this, when you're looking at the number of episodes and you're looking at the number of DUI arrests, it really focuses in on the fact that we're just touching the tip of the iceberg with this population. So let me give you some bad news. It seems like that is my role in life, is to deliver bad news. Um, DUI fatalities in 2020, when COVID started, went up by about 14%. Now, at the same time, the number of DUI arrests in 2020 went from about a million to about 700,000. So what researchers have concluded is that there was a direct correlation between the fact that there were fewer boots on the ground uh, and that had everything to do with COVID, vacancies, officers getting sick, uh, all of those issues. You have a reduction in DUI arrests and this dramatic increase in 2020 in the number of deaths on our roadways. I would love to be able to tell you that after COVID started to subside that these numbers went down, but they haven't. They've gone up another 10%. The numbers haven't been officially posted yet, but they've gone up another 10% in 2021. And just yesterday, I heard from uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that the first quarter of 2022, it's gone up by about another 7%. Your guess is as good as mine. I mean, again, we know that research is saying that a lot of this has to do with law enforcement, but it also may very well have to do with people who are despondent, who are stressed, who are drinking more because they are, are concerned about their employment situation. Uh, risky driving has gone up dramatically. I talked to a Washington state trooper who clocked an individual, and this was on a roadway, not a highway, driving 189 miles an hour. What are they thinking? So, and I know a lot of this risky behavior that we're seeing, uh, they've seen a lot of this in California. When you're not in the usual traffic jam situation, especially in 2019, 2020, that's when you really started to see these start to go up. So that's really what we are faced with. But let me just tell you, I'm gonna give you some good news, but Technically, I'm a federal consultant, so whenever I give you good news, it's going to be followed up with something negative. So, you know, you're going to feel good about something, and you're going, hey, we're making progress, and then psh, I'm going to push you right off the cliff. I'm sorry, that is my job. So here's the good news. The good news is since uh, 1982, the number of DUI fatalities have dropped by almost 50%. And there are lots of reasons for this. Social norming is a big part of it. All those public service announcements that we've been hearing actually do make a difference. Uh, younger people, it's kind of that culture that, you know what, you just don't drink and drive. Now, if everybody got that message, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, but the fact is, that we are making progress. I'm gonna give you just a quick aside when it comes to social norming and what we've seen as a real positive example. So in 1990, 11% of drivers wore a seatbelt. And there was this urban myth, and unfortunately it's still out there with some people, 
but there is this urban myth that you don't want to wear a seatbelt because if you get in a crash and your car starts on fire, you could be trapped. So flash forward now to 2019, and NHTSA did a survey, and they found that 93% uh, of drivers in this country wear a seatbelt. And it's as obvious to me as brushing your teeth in the morning. I don't know if you've ever experienced getting in a car and seeing somebody not put on a seatbelt, but I would be shocked as a driver or as a passenger seeing that. So that, my friends, is social norming. And that's where we have made progress. Unfortunately, where we are with alcohol and social norming, where we, I should say where we were with alcohol and social norming in the 80s, is where we are with marijuana and driving and social norming. There are lots of myths out there that we have to cut through, and I'm sure you've all heard them uh, in your treatment capacities, and I'm gonna to be touching on some of these in just a little bit of what we need to be going, taking a look at. But let me give you uh, a, some statistics that are specific to California. So when we talk about the number of DUI arrests going down nationally, look at the difference here between 2019 and 2020 for DUI arrests in California. That is, don't quote my math, but probably a 30% drop in uh, DUI arrests year over year. And if you look at the previous years, they're pretty consistent, about 125 to 130,000 people a year who are arrested. And when we're looking at DUI fatalities in California, that jump that I talked about nationally, you certainly see that uh, in the state of California uh, looking from 2019 to 2020. So one more slide on California before I move on uh, and get into more about the drug impaired driving. This is a map from NHTSA, and on your left you see DUI fatalities by county. And these are total fatalities uh, for each county. You know where you are, I don't in this map, but gives you an idea. But the picture on the right from NHTSA is actually much more telling. And these are DUI fatalities per 100,000 population, okay? If you are in a county in red, red is not a good color. Red is not a, hey, you guys are doing a great job. Red is, we got a problem here, folks, and we need to take a look at it. Uh, green is the lower third, I believe, and then gold is the middle third, and the counties in white had no DUI fatalities uh, that report were reported in 2020. But again, this kind of gives you an idea of what we're seeing from that 30,000 foot perspective when it comes to uh, this population. So again, we've made progress when it comes to alcohol. We have actually learned a lot about this population. We have done a much better job in being able to really focus on uh, that high priority population, oftentimes the individuals with higher BACs, uh, the use of assessment tools has made a significant impact when it comes to working with the um, DUI population, where we can really look at those risk factors, those criminogenic risk factors, and better determine who are the people that really need most of our time and attention. And I'm going to be touching on that a little bit as it relates to impaired drivers uh, in a little bit. Let's get into drug impaired driving. So this is a map of states that have legalized recreational marijuana, and it gives you just kind of a global picture of, of what this is looking like. So the states in black, including California, obviously, and uh, my state of Arizona, have legalized recreational medical marijuana. Um, this map is changing constantly. Um, and there are more and more states that are coming on board. 
And usually when you can start with medical marijuana and then from there, it's, you're uh, going to end up with recreational marijuana. So there are a few states in orange where it is fully illegal. And I had the opportunity about a year ago to do a presentation in Idaho, a state on, uh, in orange there, where it's fully illegal. And I was in Boise, and Boise is about 45 miles uh, to the east of the Oregon border. And if you drive due west to Oregon, there is a small town with nine marijuana dispensaries there to meet the needs of the greater Boise metropolitan area. And folks, those states, I was in, uh, uh, did a training in Indiana, and they said, well, why do we really need to talk about or recreational marijuana and driving? And it's like, look to the West. Your borders is with Illinois, which has legalized it. So uh, it is expanding. Congress is looking at it. I don't think anything is going to happen this year, but they're certainly looking at, uh, if nothing else, decriminalizing uh, marijuana from a federal level. Uh, whether that happens, I don't know. But just by way of quick example, so in 2020, Arizona had an election that they're still fighting over, which I'm not going to get into. But the one thing that wasn't contested was the voters by a 60% margin voted to legalize recreational marijuana. Arizona is pretty darn conservative. So who are the people who are, are looking to legalize this? Well, it is it might be progressives that don't want to see the, these become criminal. It could be uh, individuals who are conservatives that don't want to see so much money being put into uh, our prison system. Uh, so it's people all over the political spectrum that draw the same conclusion. So you've been living this for a while, but uh, I think we're going to continue to see this growing uh, over time. Uh, so one of the questions, and I'm not going to ask you to answer this, but ask yourself what you are seeing in your particular town, your jurisdiction, when it comes to DUIs. Are you seeing that this is a population where you're finding that meth or other drugs are involved? Or are you seeing that in your jurisdiction maybe they're not testing for drugs? They're just, if you get that the Holy Grail, the .08, that's all you need to concern yourself with. But whatever drugs are trending in your jurisdiction, you can pretty much bet that you're going to be seeing those uh, as it relates to your DUI. So if fentanyl is, is epidemic where you uh, reside, you're probably going to be seeing individuals under the influence of fentanyl with, D, with their DUIs. So I have a little scenario for you. A law enforcement officer pulls over a driver and he's swerving on the roadway. Officer stops. They find that there is alcohol in his breath. There's a small bag of what appears to be marijuana in his possession. And they find a prescription for Percocet on the driver's seat. So based what I am telling you, this driver is under the influence of marijuana, alcohol, Percocet, or beats the hell out of me, which would be my choice. We don't know. And that is really the overdriving issue when we're talking about this population. Now, you're not, officers typically are not going to have everything uh, that obvious to them, but we don't know with the DUI population oftentimes what they're really using. And there are a number of reasons for this. So let me talk to you about. What we do know about the drug-impaired driver and why oftentimes we know very little. And the first issue is this. 
States and counties can be incredibly inconsistent when it comes to testing individuals, especially in fatality crashes, when it comes to drugs. And by way of example, there are some jurisdictions where they only test maybe 10% of fatality crashes. There are others where they test for 90%. Same thing holds true when it comes to drug-impaired driving, non-fatality crashes. Uh, are blood tests being done? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and there are lots of challenges, time delays, the cost. Uh, I'm going to get into some of those in just a little bit. But all we can do is try to infer with what little information we have as to what we're seeing with impaired drivers and drug impaired drivers. The other challenge is you may have one county where the toxicology labs are testing for, say, four drug families uh, in fatality crashes. And another county that's testing for four, three of the four are the same, and one might be different. So all this adds up to a whole lot of inconsistency when we're talking about this population. The other issue we have is how people are actually using these drugs and when they're using these drugs. So National Highway Traffic Safety Administration does this little exercise called roadside surveys, and this is what they do. They will post signs on uh, off-ramps of highways where they will offer individuals a $5 Starbucks gift card in exchange for answering a survey as to whether or not they were under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Folks, you can get people to do anything for a $5 gift, uh, Starbucks gift card. It's amazing. If you suspect somebody of murder, say, maybe this $5 Starbucks gift card will get you to confess. I did it. Yes, I did it. I confess. Anyhow, this is what they found. Now, if you look at the bottom line here for alcohol, and they, they have this separated by uh, weekday days and weekend evenings. So weekday days with alcohol, a little over 1% of the people that were surveyed indicated that they had been drinking. Doesn't mean they were drunk. Maybe they had a beer with lunch, something like that. Weekend nights, you see that about 8% of the individuals surveyed, again, said that they had been drinking, which makes sense. You're going out for dinner. Maybe you're going to a ball game. Uh, there's nothing surprising about that. Look at marijuana. There is essentially no difference between smoking during the day and smoking on the weekend. The social norms are not the same when it comes to alcohol and drugs for that matter. So what does that mean? Time for work, time to fire up. Time for lunch, time for a gummy. Afternoon break, don't mind if I do. We can't anticipate the behaviors like we have historically been able to anticipate these behaviors with alcohol. It's a totally different beast. And when you look at uh, some of the examples with drugs and illegal drugs, you see much the same thing. This is not uh, something for celebrations and celebrations only. It's used 24-7. The other thing that we have to always remember when it comes to the DUI population is when you are using poly substances, and folks, all the research is suggesting this is the biggest threat. It's not just smoking marijuana or just drinking alcohol. It's when you're combining multiple substances. It has a synergistic effect on each other. So it's not one plus one equals two when it comes to using multiple drugs and alcohol. It's one plus one equals three. So that's what we have to be mindful of. And I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to repeat it a few more times. Folks, we can't assume. The person who comes in for treatment uh, in your program, we can't assume that alcohol is the only thing they're using. Statistically, there is probably a 50-50 chance there were other drugs, regardless of whether law enforcement finds it or not. 
I'm going to talk to you just for a minute about a study that was done, a very robust study that took place in a number of, of countries in Europe where they're looking at crash risk for different substances. And what they found is, first of all, marijuana alone uh, increased the crash risk by about 1% to 3%. The research that we've seen shows that, that marijuana alone, we have not found consistent research showing that it dramatically heightens crash risk. Uh, however, when we're, when we're talking sunny day scenario, in other words, nothing goes wrong, there is not a heightened risk of crash with marijuana users. But how often are we totally in a sunny day scenario? Let's just assume a dog goes across the street suddenly or a kid rides his bike across the street. Those are the kind of things where we really get ourselves in trouble. The reaction time when you're using marijuana is much, is much lower than when you are sober. But anyhow, if you look at the crash risk and you look at how it increases, where it goes up the most dramatically is with alcohol and another drug. Alcohol, folks, is the magic elixir. When people are using alcohol and they're mixing it with other drugs, that's when the impairment goes up dramatically, and that's when the crash risk goes up. So this is fairly new information that uh, came from Colorado, where they had tested individuals who were arrested for driving under the influence of drugs. And as you can see here, about 40% of these crashes involved alcohol, marijuana, and a third drug. So it's not necessarily just two drugs it's more. So 40% is what we're seeing are polysubstance users using multiple uh, uh, drugs. I'm going to talk to you about three studies uh, that really, I think, bring this home. One was in Dade County, Miami, Florida. Second study was in Dane County, so Madison, Wisconsin. Third uh, study was in Orange County, California. And what they did is they had individuals who had been arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. That's what the law enforcement officers stopped them and arrested them for. And they later drug tested these individuals. And they found in all three studies, very, very different populations, they found in all three studies that about 40% of these drivers had other drugs on board in their bodies in addition to just alcohol. So, th and these studies are about eight years old. So I would venture to guess that you would see a much higher number uh, in these percentages today uh, with these studies being done than certainly uh, what you saw. This is before marijuana was legalized in California. I think those numbers would probably go up. So other issues that we have, marijuana is now the second most popular drug next to alcohol, which really is not a shock. Marijuana, especially when you're smoking it, has a very, very short detection window, about 30 minutes or less which from a law, law enforcement standpoint can be a real challenge. Uh, we have younger drivers that are smoking in greater numbers uh, than what we've seen in the past. Other issues we have, uh, about a third of the individuals who use marijuana are daily smokers. And about 20% of this population uh, end up using about 80% of this product. Uh, marijuana prices have dropped dramatically, I think because there's more competition between the, the uh, different providers, that, that that certainly has something to do with it. And this next issue is probably our most telling. About 50% of the, this country's toxicology labs test for drugs other than alcohol and DUI stops. Another way to put this is 50% don't, which again, really kind of sets the table of who is this person that I'm going to be working with uh, in my treatment facility. 
So the other challenge we have, and I've really been alluding to this, is DUIs are the only cases where the investigation oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes stops when you hit that holy grail of 0.08. And there's a reason for this. We've been studying uh, alcohol-impaired driving for decades. Alcohol is unique in that it is consistent in terms of how it's absorbed uh, into the body. So when a law enforcement officer stops somebody uh, for impaired driving, they know what to look for. A prosecutor knows how to handle a DUI case. They've probably been working on these cases for years. So when you get that 0.08, you may at that point stop even considering the fact that there may be drugs on board with this individual as well. Uh, now, I want to emphasize I'm not trying to paint all law enforcement with a broad brush, but that really is kind of the reality of, of oftentimes why this happens. So why is it important to consider this? Again, who are we supervising? We may be dealing with somebody where alcohol is really incidental in their life, but their real drug of choice is meth, or their real drug of choice is fentanyl, uh, other drugs. So you all recognize these two gentlemen, Mr. Cheech and Mr. Chong? Uh, they were pretty much the face of, certainly of marijuana in the 70s, but they were also um, kind of the face of what marijuana impaired driving looked like in the 70s. So you probably believe, as I believe, that the number one reason that law enforcement would stop somebody for smoking is they're driving 35 miles an hour on the freeway. Actually, I'm going to dissolve, I'm going to get rid of a myth here. It's just the opposite. Law enforcement find that speeding and aggressive driving is much more common with marijuana impaired drivers. That when they stop, oftentimes that's what they have been involved with. So we have been all over the spectrum when it comes to marijuana. Uh, there is an attitude, and oftentimes you'll find that you know marijuana cures everything. You, between CBD oils, uh, people with schizophrenia, if they use marijuana, it'll solve that problem. Now, I am not going to be dismissive. There are people that use it for pain management and they swear by it. But I think the gist is that we still have a long way to go when it comes to research with this product. So right now, it seems like the pendulum is that marijuana is as safe as mother's milk and we have nothing to worry about. Uh, I am a child of the 60s, probably like a few of you in this room. My grandmother told me that if I smoked marijuana, I could become a sex offender or a jazz musician. So that was kind of those perceptions that we run into. And the challenge is, one hand, marijuana will cure all your ails. The other one, that you'll become a jazz musician. What is the truth? And I think one of the things that is very important for us is to not run amok with misinformation when it comes to marijuana, that we really need to stick with what we know. So some of the perceptions that we have to deal with, and you folks, good folks, have to deal with, uh, that have been around for a long time is, with marijuana users in particular, the driving high isn't a serious problem. I'm fine to drive. I drive better when I'm stoned. I've heard that one consistently than when I'm straight. I pay more attention when I'm behind the wheel under the influence. Um, it's not illegal to drive under the influence of marijuana. Yes, it is. And then my personal favorite, it's better than driving drunk. Now, how many of us have ever been told, you have a choice, you're going to drive stoned or you're going to drive drunk? Which is it going to be? So there is that third option of maybe just driving straight. So these are some of the, some of the challenges that are out there that we have to really be looking at um, as we're moving forward. So let me jump ahead a little bit. Uh, 
it gives you an idea that when somebody smokes marijuana, how it impacts them. Uh, no surprises here. But translate that when it comes to impaired driving. So poor attention to tasks, time and distance uh, issues. Law enforcement have uh, indicated that oftentimes when they see somebody at a stop sign, but they're like 20 yards before the stop sign, that that could be a sign of impairment because judging that distance. Lane tracking issues, steering corrections, um, but I think the slower reaction time, in my humble opinion, is probably one of the biggest challenges when somebody is under the influence. Other challenge that we have is the fact that states typically are way behind the curve when it comes to marijuana laws and a lack of recognition, uh, especially states that are new to medical marijuana, of how much money is behind this product. And the, corporate, the corporations that have been supporting uh, marijuana products uh, and uh, are making a whole lot of money as a result. So some of the challenges, when medical marijuana uh, became legalized in most states, the laws indicated that you could have up to three ounces of marijuana for your personal use. Well, just to put that in perspective, one ounce of marijuana equals about 60 joints. And the second thing to remember is this is not Woodstock marijuana. This is not uh, marijuana with four to five to six percent uh, THC levels. This is much, it's a much different product than what you had in the 60s. The other thing that you were allowed to do was grow up to three plants for your personal use. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree, something in a clay pot that maybe would grow like a foot tall. Folks, that's one plant uh, in front of that gentleman. So technically, I guess he could have two more for his personal use. So important to remember when you are, are looking at this that you've got science behind this, and again, you've got money behind this. The... Members of our legislature that, that started these laws had no clue that this is what one marijuana plant was going to look like. But it does tell you just, again, how much we have to learn about this product and some of the challenges that we see. This is a picture of a marijuana dispensary in Denver, Colorado, that was taken before they legalized uh, recreational marijuana. And as you can see, just looking at this place, it's not, it doesn't look like it's in the best neighborhood. Obviously, they didn't put a whole lot of money into this building, uh, but that's before legalization of recreational marijuana. That's what a dispensary oftentimes would look like. This is what dispensaries look like today. So you have a bud tender, the woman on the left, and she's official, my God, she's wearing a lab coat, so she must know what she's doing. And if you look on the right-hand side and you see uh, th these dispensaries, they're inviting, they are clean. When I first looked at these pictures, I was like, that looks like a jewelry store. But they are designed to be inviting, to look safe, People who are maybe not experienced with buying marijuana would probably feel pretty comfortable walking in the door. Now, there is a reason for this. Who are they marketing for? They're not marketing for the stoner who's going to be using every day. Folks, they're marketing for you. You are their intended audience. Those people that maybe never smoked, maybe haven't smoked since college, curious about it, maybe somebody wants to have a party, a dinner party with friends, and wouldn't it be fun to bring some gummies? That's who they're trying to get. They're trying to get new customers because that, my friends, is where the money is for them. So don't be surprised, and many of you have probably already experienced this, but don't be surprised when you have individuals that come to your office for a DUID 
that maybe look upper middle class, maybe a little older than the population that you typically deal with, because if they're marketing for marijuana with that population, they're going to get DUIs and they're going to be arrested. So the downside of that might be is some of the same resistance that you get with alcohol impaired drivers of, I didn't do anything, I'm not a criminal, I'm not like these other people. You may start seeing it if you haven't already when it comes to marijuana impaired driving. So drug driving, much more complicated than alcohol impaired driving, uh, especially with synthetic drugs, uh, much harder to detect. They can change one compound in a testing lab that could test positive for like a, a, a strain of spice, no longer can. So unfortunately, there's kind of a cat and mouse that takes place in, in trying to capture those individuals that are using. So there are lots of drugs out there. They're growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, it changes constantly. Uh, what the products are. The other challenge is, and this is important to remember, is presence doesn't equal impairment. So a law enforcement officer could test somebody uh, and discover they have marijuana in their system. That does not mean that they're impaired. Actually, that applies to pretty much every drug uh, that you can test for. That's why it's important to have drug recognition experts, law enforcement that can detect the impairment. And they are actually so sophisticated that they can understand the specifics of what that impairment is, what it does. So marijuana can stay in your system for 30 days. If you're smoking, it can be a 30 minute or less window uh, when it comes to uh, detection. And then this catchy little phrase, is, there's no BAC for THC, all right? We're, we're never going to have a definitive test. And if you look at how a lot of our marijuana laws came to be, came to be it was essentially legislators that didn't know what they were doing. That uh, in Illinois... Uh, it was kind of like making sausage. They said, well, let's say that impairment is 10 nanograms of, of uh, Delta-9 THC in your system. And somebody else said, no, I think we should make it one nanogram. So what did they do? They split the baby and said, we'll make it five. Now, I will tell you, a daily marijuana smoker with five nanograms of THC in their system is a walk in the park. You probably wouldn't know they're stoned. If it were me, I would be probably in a fetal position under my desk, weeping, and uh, wondering if I'm going to become a jazz musician. <laughs> so that's why we're never going to have a definitive uh, uh, line where we can say, this is it, and this is uh, what we're going to be seeing. So how this product is ingested matters. Smoking obviously is going to be number one, but especially for new customers, you're seeing new products that are out there. So vaping is more and more common where you're not going to detect the smell, but there are marijuana energy drinks, folks. There are marijuana patches uh, that are available. Uh, in the middle of this picture, you see marijuana inhalers. Now, if I saw somebody in my probation lobby with an inhaler, I would assume, probably like you, they have asthma. They have a lung condition. I wouldn't be thinking, ah, I, they're getting high in my office. But this is how discreet and how uh, the different options are out there in terms of how this product is used. There are edibles. Fortunately, when it comes to edibles, you shouldn't be seeing packaging like this. I think the industry recognized how dangerous this was because two things are going to happen. If you leave this out and you have a kid in the house, oh, a Kit Kat bar. I love those. Uh, so the packaging uh, has changed. It's much more difficult to get in, and they don't have it uh, typically where it appeals to, to children this way. So when it comes to enforcement, law enforcement, how are they tackling this? Uh, 
it's a challenge. It is a huge challenge for law enforcement to try to get ahead of all this. Perfect example. If you saw, uh, if a law enforcement officer saw an individual driving a car and this is what they saw, would they stop them? No, they absolutely don't have grounds to. If they had rolled a joint and they were smoking and the, and the officer could smell it, absolutely they could stop them. So detection is much more challenging today, certainly than it was uh, before all the technology got involved when it comes to uh, smoking. Law enforcement training to become a drug recognition expert, which is really the gold standard for law enforcement, takes about one month of training. In addition, you have to have an annual training, refresher trainings. So imagine this for law enforcement on top of all the other trainings that they have to deal with. So the number of officers that are boots on the ground that are trained as drug recognition experts uh, or even uh, experts in terms of, of doing standard field sobriety tests are not what we need. And some of you can probably relate to this. What happens to an officer that is gung-ho about doing uh, uh, training to become a drug recognition expert? They get promoted. They're no longer boots on the ground, okay? Not the officer's fault, but that is kind of the reality. But these are the different ways that officers can uh, try to detect drug-impaired driving through this training. Uh, not all officers have these tools, not anywhere near as many as we should. Oral fluid testing uh, is really, I believe, our future when it comes to testing. It's going to be distant future, but it's part of our future. So I'm going to show you, just uh, give you an idea of some of the products that are out there that law enforcement is using. And there are some jurisdictions that have these tools in their squad cars. And what they can do is it's an oral swab, and it will detect the presence of drugs. Now, it doesn't detect impairment, but really the best way to describe this is it's a corroborative tool for law enforcement. So if they see somebody displaying all the signs of meth impairment or heroin impairment, opioids, um, and they use this test, it helps them to confirm what they are actually seeing with their eyes and ears. So I think you're gonna see this more and more in the future, and I'm hoping when it comes to post-sentence for probation departments, community supervision, uh, for treatment where you have some testing requirements, that at some point down the road, we're gonna have the ability to be using these tools as well. And the reason I'm hopeful for this is, first of all, you're getting information quickly. Uh, these tests can be as accurate as blood tests. And any of you who've had the experience of having to observe urinalysis tests, like me, this would be a welcome change when it comes to uh, the world of testing. As a price point, it's still, I think, cost prohibitive in most cases, but don't be surprised if you start seeing this as, as an option. Cannabis breathalyzers, they have been working on this. I still, I kept thinking that within my career, uh, I would see this and I'm not as hopeful as I was. It's expensive, um, but they are designed to show the presence of THC, which is if you're gonna have a test, that's what you want. You wanna be able to, to show that they are, have the active THC in their system. So, Let's talk about what supervision means with this population. So I could have easily replaced this with said no probation officer ever and say no treatment provider ever because I know the same message comes uh, happens to you. We're all overworked. We have too much going on. We have too many clients. Uh, so we're always trying to keep up. And quite frankly, this is another wrinkle in what we have to be working on uh, with our populations. So what are the tools that are available? 
when we're talking about DUIs, and I'm including drug-impaired drivers in this as well, uh, about 30% of the people that we deal with are repeat offenders. This is not their first rodeo. Two-thirds of the people who get DUIs, we never see again. Their first DUI is their last DUI. Now, we don't know that they stopped drinking, and I don't know for our purposes if that is a primary concern. We just don't see them again. It's that other third that come back and come back and come back. The other thing that we know with this population is incarceration alone doesn't change their behavior. And I can tell you anecdotally, but I hear this consistently, it's more and more common for the, our DUI population to say, you know what, I want to burn my number, I want to do my jail time, I don't want your treatment, I don't want your supervision, I want you just to leave me alone. So the risk areas that we have with the DUI population, and this applies to drug impaired drivers, let me just kind of walk through these because these are the criminogenic risk factors that good DUI assessment tools are really able to capture. So the first one is the number of prior DUIs. And I know, well, duh, but the reality is the more priors you have, the more likely you are to have a future DUI. The second one is non-DUI involvement uh, in the justice system. Folks, people who have traffic citations, numerous traffic citations, speeding, running red lights, driving without a license or insurance, more likely to get a future DUI. Well, why is that? What's their attitude towards authority? What's their attitude towards others? Also, those people that have non-DUI criminal activities, so thefts, drug charges, for the same exact reasons that we're talking about. Third factor that we have is polysubstance use. And I think I've beaten that horse to death, but you get the idea. Those individuals, let's say that you're going to put an ignition interlock on their vehicle, they can flit. Ooh, my gosh, I can't drink. Well, I've got weed. I've got whatever is in my grandmother's medicine cabinet to use, and I'll keep using. So that polysubstance using population. Fourth factor, mental health and mood adjustment. 33% of men, 50% of women with multiple DUIs uh, have a diagnosable mental health condition. And PTSD can be up there. Uh, if, if any of you are involved with veterans courts, oftentimes DUIs are that entry point for individuals to get into veterans courts. Uh, but depression, the important thing to remember is if we're not looking at what's going on with their mental health, we can be really, really missing the boat with this population. And then the final one is past noncompliance with attempts to uh, address these behaviors. So those people that didn't complete uh, your treatment program. Uh, people who don't complete or don't abide by ignition interlock, strong, strong predictor of a future DUI. Um, those people that don't complete probation, uh, major factor as well. So these five factors apply not only to alcohol-impaired drivers, but they also apply to drug-impaired drivers. So there are assessments that can capture this. I do training on the impaired driving assessment. Shameless plug on my part to mention that. But um, it is a tool that's being used typically post-sentence by probation departments. And uh, just FYI, it is free. All the training is free. Uh, it was developed and paid for by uh, NHTSA. So there are some good tools that are out there that can capture some of the risk and some of the uh, needs that are available with this population. But what we believe is these assessments should be what we use to drive decision making, especially when it comes to supervision. So that we're really focusing on the major risk factors for these individuals. Folks, I've been around long enough that uh, back in the day, as a young probation officer, when I'd ride a horse and chariot to work, the message was follow the bottle, and that was really what we were told, is just keep people separated from alcohol and uh, test them a lot and you'll be fine. 
That worked exactly never when it came, at least with my experience, working with this population. So using these assessments can really help. Now what about using ignition interlock device? If you have somebody who's on for drug-impaired driving, does it make sense to use this tool? And the answer is yes. Remember, polysubstance abusing population. So if they were stopped for marijuana, don't think if you're gonna be testing that they won't start drinking. So there's not a downside to using uh, ignition interlock. And for some of you, I'm not sure the laws in California you may be required to use those. Where do you put these people in terms of problem solving court? Does a drug impaired driver go to a drug court? And the answer to that is no, they go to a DUI court. And the reason is we're addressing the behaviors that lead to these actions. And uh, a DUI court is really where we want to place these people. Uh, ready to wrap up here, I do have just a couple things I want to end with why your work is so incredibly important. You're not just impacting the individual who is sitting in your office uh, or in your group. You're impacting their families, you're impacting their spouses, you're impacting the community. So it's important, I think, that we remember just how significant this problem is and how important all your work is. So with that said, thank you all so much. I appreciate it.